Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to Hero Movie Podcast, your greatest source for superhero movie discussion in the multiverse. I am your host, Adam Portress, and I'm joined by Sean Keenan. I'm always here, Heidi. I'm always here. And of course, Bruce Leslie. I'm a prickly pear, and why no mention of Nuclear Man in this film? Oh, you know, you gotta erase all the canon that you can, and we're here to talk about all what you can and, and cannot do in a superhero <laughs> movie. <laughs> I see what you did, <laughs> canon films. I tell you what. Anyways, uh, today we are going to be talking about Superman Returns. That's right, there was a time when uh, we had like, what well, we'll call a middle Superman, I guess. You know? Because we, we had middle Christopher... Superman? Yeah. yeah. We had Christopher Reeve, and then we had kind of our interim Superman with Brandon Routh, and now we're on to uh, Superman Prime. <laughs> Isn't that how it works? I guess. So uh, we'll be talking about Superboy some of that. Prime. Yeah. yeah. We'll talk about some of that stuff today and a whole bunch of other things. But uh, first, we do have an email here, and I know we don't get a ton of emails on this program, but when we do, by golly, we are going to be reading them. So let's open up the old HMP mailbag. <laughs> Bales here. Uh, this one comes to us from some fella named Marty. I don't under I don't get it. It's entitled Help. Uh oh. Let's hope things aren't uh, too dangerous. Hey guys, I've been driving for a couple of days for work, so I've been catching up on a load of podcasts. The only problem is I don't know whether I should stay super or be one of the good guys because there's far too many of the bad or storm the castle. One thing I do know is that heroes are super. Help your good friend, Marty. <laughs> you can't go wrong with Storm in the Castle, Marty. You can't go wrong. You're, you're, you're literally surrounded by castles in merry old England. Don't they just don't they give those out like uh, around your 18th birthday? You just go get your castle over there in England? Ain't that how it works? Nope. You have to find somebody that already has a, has a castle, and you just have to storm in and take it from them. It's a rich tradition of taking people's castles from them in uh, England. That's true. You know what word I like a lot? Fiefdom. Oh, yeah, man. I miss the good old days of fiefdom. That's a, that's a good word there, fiefdom. Because like, there's some people that are going to know what that is. And most people are going to be like, I, what, it's a, I don't know. But, but. <laughs> yeah, it meant a totally different thing to say surfs up in medieval times. <laughs> that's when your surfs are flying through the air uh, on the catapult <laughs> that you constructed to knock down the walls of your enemy. <laughs> That's how it's I remember. It's cheaper it. to fling poor people at them than weapons. I love that idea. I don't think that. Uh, and uh, oh, guess what, boys? We also have an iTunes review. That's right. It's been a little bit, but we got another one. Wow, that's still a thing that happens. It is. Uh, this one is entitled "Feeding My Superhero Habit," and it's five stars, aka a humdinger. Humdinger. Oh my goodness! Thank you. Uh, and it's from Nate from Charleston. And uh, Nate writes as follows. Love this podcast after seeing Ant-Man and the Wasp and realizing there wasn't another MCU movie for the rest of 2018. I needed a fix, and these guys do the job. Funny and insightful. That's from Nate from Charleston, uh, giving us a five-star review on iTunes, a.k.a. Humdinger. Humdinger. And we'd really Thank appreciate you. it if anyone else would go down and uh, you know help us out with a five-star review. We really appreciate everybody that does so. And guess what? We've already got one for next week as well. So we'll uh, we'll read that one on next week's episode, everybody. But that's good stuff, man. And, uh, well, I'm going to say it here at the top of the show because we do, we do a lot of plugs at the bottom of the show. But I want to do a plug at the top of the show because it's very, very important here. Uh, one of us is now a published author. Congratulations. To yourself. <laughs> Congratulations, <laughs> Bruce. You walked into a comic book store. Did you did you actually walk into a store and pick up and pick up the book you wrote? No, I have some advanced copies, but um on further <laughs> further investigation, I think that the North American release might be September fifteenth. I think it was the European and British release that happened August fifteenth. But I've gotten lots of photos from people across the pond who've managed to pick up the comic there. So I haven't quite been able to get my hands on it in a store, but I had some sent to me by the good folks at uh, 2000 AD. So I have seen it. Yeah, we like, need to figure out what that stuff. is so we can actually install you in a comic book <laughs> store and kind of like, yes. you know, you remember that episode of The Simpsons where Stan Lee came into town and he was just trying to bust all his own stuff and just like, hey, how about you buy this? I love it. I, I see. I want to start a you. whispering campaign. I'm just going to like whisper to myself on different sides of the aisle. Hey, did you hear about the vigilant? Oh, I heard that one's good. You better buy it. They're running out quick. Oh, I better buy two. <laughs> 
I hear that Bruce Leslie story is the best one in there. <laughs> just <laughs> that kind of crap. I Listen, Yeah. all I'm saying is you just got to get yourself a trench coat and a hat. You're good to go, buddy. So I've got to, uh, I'm going to ask Sean for some advice here. Okay. So tell me, would it be a good idea or a bad idea for me just to go to Google and type in the Vigilant Comic Reviews? Do not do it. Okay, thank you. That's what, that's what my do, gut was telling me. <laughs> do not do it. And, and see, uh, uh, this is going to be impossible for Adam. <laughs> but what, uh, what I would highly, highly suggest is if we get to a certain level of success at some point here, we need to stop Googling our names. We need to stop looking at reviews. And I can't imagine that that Adam will ever have the 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 uh, I don't I, I, I can't even think of the word right now. But Adam will not be able to help himself. He'll always do that. <laughs> we need to have a PA that gets the emails and only sends Adam the positive ones. <laughs> yeah, there you go. If you would like to uh, ask for if you'd like to get this position, uh, email us with. Uh, <laughs> PA position in the subject title. I don't know how th- that I'm going to route anything to you. And I'm not going to do that. Uh, it's too much. Wor- it's too much work even to set up that someone does most of the work for me. Is that messed up? Yeah. Yeah. Sean, uh, Adam's uh, Adam's definition of too much work is work. Yeah. Yeah. Any any level at all of preparedness. <laughs> I like I like to think of myself as like you know one of the many songs in the, in like the seventies that was all about like you know whether it's like BTO or Dire Straits just about how like I'm just kind of kicking back and doing nothing while the rest of the world goes on and bust their humps and stuff <laughs> yeah. and I'm like hey man I'm just over here doing me <laughs> maybe you know get a blister was, on your little finger you know what I was thinking about the other day Adam is do you remember that time you went up on stage. And you said nothing for an entire like five minutes. Yes, I did. Breaker. Yes, yes, I do remember. And, and, and you made and you made the I, I can't even remember the name of the guy who ran that room. You made him so upset. He was like, "You are not going to come up on stage for a good long time." And uh, <laughs> I and wish I could have like, been there. And he said, and he said to Adam, "You know, you you, you have wasted everyone's time because there are people who wanted to go up, and you took one of their spots." And Adam was not only unapologetic. He, in, in true Adam fashion, said back to the guy, well, I think that uh, they are wasting everyone's time by thinking that they should be performing. <laughs> <laughs> that does sound like an awful Adam thing to say, doesn't it? <laughs> that that is, I, 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 I was remembering it the other day. I might be remembering some of it wrong, but I don't think I am. Pr- I think that I got all of it right. That's probably See, pretty Sean, accurate. There's only one way to handle that if you're the open mic uh, host, and that's at the end of the five minutes to ask everybody to give him a hand because it's his best set ever. <laughs> See? Yeah, basically, that's the only thing you can do. See, there's yeah. ways to get around it. In fact, what I'm going to say is I went so far as to uh, challenge that uh, that host to become <laughs> a better host. In fact, one might say I'm the Obi-Wan Kenobi of all of that person's uh uh, life See, from that point. So uh, it's good to know that you've learned absolutely nothing <laughs> from that experience, Adam. Uh, As a matter of fact, if anything, you've gotten worse <laughs> from that experience. And I think there's like a, an old Buddhist expression that says, "Before speaking, make sure that what you have to say is an improvement upon the silence." I like it that Adam took that to heart. You bet I do. I take everything to heart, and I'd like, you know, anyways. Let's get into the show, everybody, because you know what I like? I like superhero movies, and I thought I liked this one. Uh, but So we're going to go ahead and take a listen to the trailer for Superman Returns. If it decides to play. You've been gone a long time. Where did you go? Hello. Yeah, well, you've been gone. Fearless reporter Lois Lane is a mommy. 
but if you ask me, she's still in love with you know who. How could you leave us like that? I moved on, so did the rest of us. The world doesn't need a savior, and neither do I. This is kind of a little reunion, isn't it? Heck, I'm a fan. I'll have advanced technology. Thousands of years beyond what anyone could throw at me. But millions of people will die. Billions! You wrote that the world doesn't need a savior. But every day I hear people crying for one. <laughs> Come on, let me hear you say it just once. You're insane. No! <laughs> no, it would be other thing. Superman will never. That was the trailer for Superman Returns, our retro review of the week. Here's the IMDb plotline. As we know, IMDb always 100% correct in everything they say and or do. Superman reappears after a long absence, but is challenged by an old foe who uses Kryptonian technology for world domination. <clears throat> It was directed by Brian Singer, starring Brandon Routh, Kevin Spacey, Kate Bosworth, James Marsden, Parker Posey, Frank Langella, and more. And, uh, well, we all know who Superman is, so who knows where in the wide, wide world of sports he's going to go with this. But we've got, to, we've got to do it, man. It's time for Bruce's comic book connection. Bruce, what do you got for us this week? Lois Lane is one of the OG supporting characters of Superman. So OG, in fact, that her first appearance was Action Comics number one. Something about Lois that you may find interesting is Lois's physical appearance was originally based on Joanne Carter, a model hired by Joe Schuster. Now, I tried telling my wife that I needed to hire a lady model for my comic books, but that just didn't fly in the <laughs> Leslie household. But anyway, here's the part where reality gets more melodramatic than fiction. Though Joanne was hired by Schuster, she later married Siegel. Plot twist. You guys didn't see that coming, did you? No. Well, the future Mrs. Siegel was born in Cleveland, Ohio in 1917, the daughter of Hungarian immigrants. In 1935, while attending high school, she placed an advertisement in Cleveland's The Plain Dealer, offering her services as a model. The ad stated, and I quote, Situation wanted, female artist model, no experience. You know, I like to think times have changed a lot since 1935, but I know that they probably haven't. I think there was a pretty darn good chance that that whole thing could have went haywire, so I'm just glad it turned out well for the young lady. But Joe Schuster, who was working on a new comic character, Superman, responded to that ad. And prior to the modeling sessions, Schuster's co-creator, Jerry Siegel, had developed an idea for a journalist to be Superman's love interest, Lois Lane. Schuster hired her as a model for his Lois, and his depiction of Lois was based on drawings of her hairstyle and facial features. Interviewed in 1996 by The Plain Dealer, she recalled, I remember the day I met Jerry in Joe's living room. Jerry was the model for Superman. He was standing there in a Superman-like pose. He said their character was going to fly through the air, and he leaped off the couch to demonstrate. Now, guys, I can't tell you how perfect that romance sounds to me. Why didn't I ever do that on a first date? Could you imagine how irresistible I would be wearing a cape and just leaping off a sofa while I pretend to fly? That would be, as the ladies' men like to say, something that could seal the deal. <laughs> but I, I saw pictures of Mrs. Siegel from 1976 when she was 59 years young, and I can honestly say that she was indeed lovely. In fact, she easily holds her own with the list of other Lois Lanes like Phyllis Coates, Noel Neal, Terry Hatcher, Erica Durance, and Margot Kidder. Uh, it's sometimes important to separate comic book heroes like Lois Lane from real-life heroes like Joanne Carter Siegel. 
Mrs. Siegel built warships during World War II. She showed the Axis powers that she could do it. She was a wonderful mother to a beautiful daughter named Laura, and she remained married to Jerry Siegel until his death in 1996. She was also, perhaps, the single biggest force for creators' rights in the history of comics. Despite the success of Superman in comic books, television, and motion pictures, Jerry Siegel and Joe Shuster had sold the copyright to Detective Comics famously for 130 bucks. Now, the Siegels led a modest lifestyle. Their daughter recalled, and I quote, My mother and father lived in complete poverty for many, many years. End quote. Uh, Siegel, Mrs. Siegel, worked for a time as one of California's early car saleswomen. She sold used Chevys from a lot in Santa Monica to help support the family. But also, in order to provide for her family, Siegel devoted herself to reclaiming the original Superman copyright. At one point, she called the publisher of Superman, which is DC Comics, if you're not familiar, and she said, quote, How can you sit by and continue to make millions of dollars off of a character that Jerry co-created and allow him to live in this unbelievable poverty? Question mark, end quote. Now, in the late 1970s, DC Comics agreed to pay Siegel and Schuster a stipend of $20,000 per year for life. But Joanne Siegel said, take that $20,000 and shove it in your ear, and she continued the fight. Even after her husband died in 1996, she carried on. She filed a lawsuit in 1999 seeking partial ownership of the Superman character. In 2006, Mrs. Siegel won a partial summary judgment in a lawsuit with DC Comics. The court found that Joanne Siegel and her daughter had successfully recaptured the Superboy copyright in 2004 and opined that the television program Smallville was infringing on the Siegel's copyright. In 2008, Siegel secured a further ruling from a federal court in Los Angeles, restoring her husband's co-authorship share of the original Superman copyrights. In a 72-page decision, which I will now read for you, and no, no. In a 72-page decision, the court ruled that Jerry Siegel was entitled to claim a share of the United States copyright to Superman, while leaving intact DC Comics' international rights to the character. Following the ruling, Joanne Siegel told the press. We were just stubborn. It was a dream of Jerry's, and we just took up the task. Look at that, guys. That dogged determination to claim some equity in an all-too-unfair publishing world. That sounds like something a certain comic book character would do. That sounds exactly like what Lois Lane would have done in that situation. So let's raise our glass to the real-world Lois Lane, the late Joanne Carter Siegel. Yeah, yeah. That's great. Cool story, man. I ran across yeah. it by accident. I was just going to write about Lois Lane, and then I found all this interesting stuff about uh, Mrs. Siegel. I didn't know any of that. That's amazing. Very interesting. So the year is now 2006. Brian Singer is hot off of two very successful X-Men movies, and uh, they kind of are like, hey, what do you want to do? And uh, he actually decides to switch camps and go do some uh, DC work. And who do you pick? Ooh. Of course, the Man of Steel. What's up? Uh, how do we want to talk about that, man? He had a good thing going with X-Men, and he really burned temporarily. I guess it's not burned if it's temporary, but he darn near burned Bridges with uh, Fox when he went to do this. And he took one of the actors with him when he did it, you know? And, like, it, it's so substantial. I mean, I don't know what they paid him for this, but, I mean, the budget for this movie back in 2006 was $230 million dollars. Crazy for that time. Unbelievable. I mean, to give you an idea, almost 10 years later, uh, the first Avengers costs about that. And that's, that's I, I almost a say the, difference. The, the, <laughs> recent, the recent Justice League probably had a budget pretty close to what this movie had. Yeah. Well, they've learned. They've since learned. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so uh, if I can speak uh, about generalities with this movie sure. first, if you guys are cool with that. Um, so... Uh, I, I, you you had kind of tipped your hat at the beginning of this show, Adam. Uh, I, I remembered liking this movie, um, and now in retrospect, I, I see I see this movie for what this movie is. Uh, I think that everyone is miscast in this movie. Literally, every single actor is miscast in this movie, and Brian Singer should never have directed this movie. Um, it's it's not what Superman is. Uh, you know, one of the things that I really loved about even even uh, uh, Superman four 
is that there is so much hope in in and fun in those movies and all of that is gone in this one there there is nothing fun there's a yeah. lot of there's a lot of brooding and staring off into the middle distance there's a lot of like wishes that are unfulfilled in this movie there's a lot of like just everybody's sad all the time in this movie i i and there and go ahead I think the one of the big problems, you know, it's lacking all that fun. And I think one of the big problems is that Brian Singer was such a fan of uh, the first two Superman movies. And in particular, you can tell really big fan of the Donner movie that uh, he wanted to make this loving homage. And he almost forgot that comedy was part of that or something like like or maybe he thought it wasn't it was disrespectful to put in the funny, silly stuff. And he wanted to take that out. You know, because it's so clear that this is supposed to be in that world, but it's so clear that it is not in that world. You know, it's this weird half measure where you're putting everything in there to remind us of the uh, Richard Donner Superman from 1978. And uh, at the same time, this totally misses the point that uh, Donner managed to have his hands on. You know what I mean? And it's like I was saying oh, totally. earlier that this is, like I said, the, and, and I mean this in, in, in a tonal sense as well, that the this Superman is kind of the trans, transitional Superman. We go from Donner Superman, and this one is kind of like has a foot in both worlds of Donner's and the uh, the overdramatic uh, everything that we got from you know Snyder's stuff on. And you know, uh, uh, Brandon Ruth came out of nowhere for this movie, and one of the big reasons that they gave, I mean, I can remember the actual. TV coverage, the Entertainment Tonight style TV coverage at the time when this movie was in pre-production, and they were talking about who was going to play Superman. And there was a lot of folks wanting Tom Welling to do it, but then when Brandon Ruth got the role, I mean, I, Brian Singer basically came out and said, "Yeah, it's because t- in my eyes he looks a lot like Christopher Reeve. Like just straight up look alike casting can be a problem. You know, there's a a difference in a, an homage, a parody, and then an imitation. And I don't think he knew what he wanted to do here." Some parts yeah. were an imitation because, you know, I don't care how bad the lighting is or how much you squint. There's a big gap between Kevin Spacey and Gene Hackman in terms of what they look like. <laughs> well, not, not only that either. You know, the, the CG is awful in this movie. You know, it's still, eh, they, see, they still see, I've got, nail it. I've got a very forgiving eye for the CG, especially when I'm, you know, comparing it to the blue screen and the green screen work that we have from Superman. Yeah. And, uh, 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 the, uh, I'm sorry. Go ahead. Good, no, no, another, go ahead. another weird thing too is they really sort of tried to make Sam Huntington look like the Jimmy Olsen from the original uh, uh, movie, but it, it was just a little bit off. It was kind of like stage production. High school stage production wants to convince you that they've got the guy that looks like the actor from the movie. Like they tried so hard to squeeze Sam Huntington into that Jimmy Olsen role. But then they put no effort into finding, like, I think Parker Posey, who plays uh, Kitty, would have probably been closer to, to the Margot Kidder style Lois Lane than uh, the, the lady from that surfing movie was. Uh, Kate Bosworth, is that her name? Yes. Kate Bosworth, or as I like to say, uh, you know, kind of low rent uh, Rachel McAdams. <laughs> well, Rachel McAdams or yeah, Amy Adams? Rachel McAdams. Okay, because... Uh, I've read somewhere that Amy Adams actually auditioned for Lois Lane this time around, <laughs> which is weird because <laughs> they really, you know, this movie and Amy Adams, I'm not a big fan of her Lois Lane either. Like, like they, it's hard to believe how badly Lois Lane has been miscast in movies, but they seem to do just fine on TV. They did fine in the old movies. I don't understand. They're, they're more, maybe more uh, focused on star power than an actual good fit for Lois Lane. I mean, Case Bosworth's not a name that like put put butts in seats. I don't know why they picked her then, man. I don't know. I mean, she was definitely more of a name then than she is now. Well, it's the problem with this entire movie is that uh, you know you have really good people in it, and or or you know people who are fine, you know they're just fine actor wise, or they're really good, and they're all wrong. Everybody's wrong. I mean, Frank Langella as as Perry White is. It, 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 that is not good casting. That is not who you should have in that role. But He's I would have been far. curious. I would have almost been curious to see Frank Langella's Lex Luthor, though. And, and that's what I mean. Again, I, you know, he because there's something about Frank Langella that there's a menace to him that uh, Perry White should never have. 
and and uh, uh, and he doesn't have it. You know, and, and Kevin Spacey, it's weird watching Kevin Spacey in this movie because I can remember thinking that he was the best part of the movie when I first saw it. But now, you know, with, uh, with his past catching up to him, uh, it's it, it's a completely different role now. And, and then it, 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 you can't help but think about it. At least I couldn't. I couldn't help but think about it as I was watching it. And Singer brought uh, Marsden over from the X-Men franchise to this for this meaningless nothing role that he has. I mean, this is what kind of got him more or less blacklisted from X3, which wasn't a great movie. But, you know, it's a paycheck he lost to do this weird thing. You know, a role that uh, has no charisma in it. Like, he's he's mu- way too good of an actor for this bizarre little role they have him shoved in. Yeah, I, I think what they were... I think that they might have been going for something here where it's that, you, you know, like... Because that character doesn't behave the way that a, a character like that would behave in most comic book movies. Because you know? like you, you're supposed to hate this guy. Jerk. Yeah, you're supposed right. to hate him. He's a lovable guy, and at the end, you're just like, Lois would do well probably with this guy, you know? Yeah. And, I, and it's, uh, you know, it's one of those issues where, to me, it's pretty obvious uh, that Singer just wanted to kind of rip off uh, J. Jonah Jameson's son and the dynamic he had with Spider-Man and Mary Jane and everything from Marvel, then came over here and didn't have the, didn't know how to do it. You know, I, I don't get it. I don't get it. That role is kind of wasted. It's a weird reason to burn a bridge at Fox once again. Uh, so many bizarre decisions made with this movie. You know, trying so hard, even with the intro, even with the intro being essentially identical to those Salkin movies. Yeah, it and, was, and, it was, and it you're was having Kevin, you're having Kevin Spacey kind of play it like Gene Hackman, who always had the hair, not because he really wore wigs, but because he didn't want to shave his head or wear a skin cap for the role. Um, and you have him wearing the silly wigs, but not really coming across like that. And then you totally replace Miss Tessmacher with Parker Posey, which it's not even the casting that bothers me, but why don't you go ahead and just call her Miss Tessmacher instead of yeah. creating a whole new character named Kitty? Yeah. And none of it makes sense. It's like half measures don't do anybody any favors. Either tell your own story and create your own Superman world, or if you're going to try to do this uh, – ill-advised true sequel to a movie that's you know 30 years old then then try to actually do it you know don't do these half measures well they said initially they were like uh miss posey we're gonna have you as miss test and she goes do you think i'm that ugly and they were like you know what we're just renaming i'm sorry that was that was rude i love parker posey but she has no business being in this movie oh i, I honestly yeah. <laughs> You know, if you're going to tell your own story and not try to make it a true sequel, I think it would have been interesting to make her uh, Lois Lane. She would have been good, actually. She would have been a really good Lois Lane. I was trying to think of, it's 2006. Who do you cast as Lois Lane at this point? You know, because you need somebody who's brassy and you need somebody who can, and, you know, and stand Margo- up to people. Margot Kidder always did bring like a certain amount of energy to it, which, you know, knowing what we know about her, uh, uh, you know, her, her personal health situation outside, I understand where that energy came from, mm-hmm. but, but, you know, maybe bring in somebody else with a quirky energy to it. I don't know who yeah. was big in 2006. Lisa I think Kudrow is done a good job. Lois Lane. <laughs> Who's that? Lisa Kudrow is Loris, Lois Lane. Uh, that's an odd choice, but uh, <laughs> then again, why not just bring in Terry Hatcher? I don't care. I'm not being picky at this point. I want anybody but uh, Kate Bosworth or Amy Adams at this point. 42-year-old Terry Hatcher comes on the set. It's like, what's this kid doing here? <laughs> you have a choice between uh, Kate Winslet, Meryl Streep, or Helen Mirren. Which one are we going to pick? Oh, Helen Mirren. <laughs> I just want to see her fly. That's just me. <laughs> Uh, so the, one of the things, like I said, there's a lot of, there is a lot of staring into the middle distance within this movie. It is, uh, I, I think Brian Singer really wanted to, uh, get, kind of be that, I think he thought that this was going to bring him into a higher echelon of directors 
that can not only do like superhero things, but do like very arty sort of superhero things and just like, hey man, this like it is. It's very much a precursor to the Zack Snyder stuff of like, look at look at all of this meaning, look at the weight of this stuff. And they do and they end up doing the same crap that they've done in movies forever and a day, which, you know, you get to the defeated thing and Superman's going down in the Christ pose and stuff. It's just like any more on the nose things you want to do for us movie. Yeah, I mean Superman must have a fake death in every movie now. You know, it's become such a weird trope. I, I can still remember the point where to suggest Superman could die would be, like, just ridiculously uh, outrageous. And now it's a, a must-have in any movie with Superman. <laughs> I was just like, have you made it to the third act and is Superman still alive? It's time to kill him. Yeah. And also another weird thing, like these half measures. When Brandon Ruth is Clark Kent and he has the glasses on and he's around the Daily Planet, he is really trying to do his best impersonation of Christopher Reeves, uh, uh, Clark Kent. But then when he has on the Superman suit and he's, it, it, he totally loses the boy scout nature that, uh, uh, Christopher Reeve have had, you know, once again, it's this half measure where he's really trying to make us think that this is indeed the same Clark Kent, but it's a totally different Superman. I, I don't know what to make of that. I find it distracting. It's also weird just casting him in the first place because yes, he looks, uh, he looks a bit like Christopher Reeve, but, uh, you know, at the point of 2006, is Brandon Ruth really the, the most handsome man in the world? You know, isn't that what Superman's supposed to be? He's supposed to be the most handsome man in the world at the time. And Brandon, I can remember seeing him in this movie and thinking, well, that, because he's good looking, sure, but I, I, I don't know if he's the most handsome man I've ever seen in my life, you know? I don't know, man. Maybe he is. I've never met him in person. He might be one of those folks in person. They just take your breath away. Could be. Could be. But usually it's the other way around. Yeah. Well, I don't know, man. It's it's weird. It's more like um, if somebody is supposed to be kind of the schluppy, schlebby, the, the, the ugly best friend or the not cute girl, and then you meet them in person somewhere, you're just blown away by how they clearly stand out in the crowd. Oh, but yeah. then when somebody's like the drop-dead sexy one, you know, it's like, uh, Hollywood, by nature, has a way of uh, pushing the extremes from what you what really is, you know. So when I meet people that are supposed to be like normal, I'm just jaw dropped at like how they're definitely not normal. <laughs> yeah, like I mean, this is the not for nothing. The, we have a couple every now and then somebody like you know and, of somewhat uh, fame comes into our theater, or whatever. Uh, but uh, one of the people that comes in there all the time is uh, Angie Harmon, and like I didn't know I you know. I know who she is, but I when I saw her, I was just like, I you know, she just looked like another you know, pretty lady of age, and uh, somebody's just like, oh no, she's allowed to do these horrible, not not horrible things, but things that are normally against our company policies. They're like, just let her do it. Just she's a famous person. Just go ahead. And, and for the record, the sexiest man alive in two thousand six was George Clooney, and he'd already been down that superhero <laughs> pathway, <laughs> and it was not a pretty one. <laughs> Sometimes you want to learn to leave well enough alone. <laughs> <laughs> also, uh, also, he's probably not the right choice in 2006 or, you know, any, anywhere around there. So there's <laughs> something about George Clooney where you're like, I don't want that guy saving me. Yeah. It also something about, you know, a Superman with uh, uh, that's a silver fox Superman. That's just a weird look. The, the silver hair. Hey, ooh, is Clooney at the end, like, you know, kind of the end of day Superman. I, I, mm, could, could be also, worse. <laughs> Something like for a movie that is longer than it needs to be. I mean, it was even 15 minutes longer at first and then uh, Singer cut it back a little bit more, but still longer than this movie justifies. They really feel like they're holding a lot back for that sequel that Singer just seems to be convinced is going to come out. You're right. This movie is way, way, way too long. And uh, uh, we haven't even gotten to... Uh just how creepy Superman is in this movie. He is so creepy. He He's constantly checking in on Lois and, you know, like basically pe peeking through the bushes to see how she's doing and stuff. And he'll just, he'll just float around out there at their, at their beautiful lake house, who, who uh, which I'm, I'm guessing that is, uh, that's Richard's money that did that. Uh, I, but my word. And I feel like this is, uh, the middle section of a three-part story. And I also feel like it's the most boring part of the story. 
So, man, starting with this was a bad idea. And I've always kind of had this little philosophy, like holding back stuff that's cool for the sequel is a surefire way to make sure you don't get a sequel. Like, man, you got to fill that first movie full. Like, you're never going to get to make another movie again as long as you live, because you might not. And I think holding back for the sequel probably hurt this one. But uh, there's a movie like what in the world was going on while Superman was gone for five years? Like, I think there's something interesting there, like Superman's exploration of Krypton or something. Yeah. Like that whole five years without Superman, there's an interesting story to tell there. And then the movie, like it totally exploring this kid, you know, uh, Jason, the, the son of Superman, like, that sounds like an interesting movie, but man, this is all just like the 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 bridge between movie one and movie three that stinks. Yeah, I agree. Like this is all just the grunt work to move you through that middle part of the second act, the sagging middle. They should have just called this Superman the sagging middle. I listen. It didn't. Here's the thing: while this movie costs around two hundred thirty million dollars to make. Uh, globally, it only made around 300, which after prints and advertising, that's not a profitable movie. So this, I mean, it just maybe they might eke by, but not really. So uh, this, it's not something that people were overly interested in for sure. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, cause I, I don't remember there being a ton of heat on this movie either. And you know, I, could, I mean, we saw I, it, but I couldn't picture much successful, like franchising out of this either. I can't imagine kids wanting to run out and buy this version of Superman toys and lunch boxes and shirts and stuff. Oh, like, let me get let, let me get the action figure of Superman sad kid Jason <laughs> White. Let's get yeah, I want the Jason complete with asthma inhaler action figure. Yes. <laughs> More of that, please. But you know, if you're gonna reveal that Jason is the uh son of Superman, the whole movie needs to be more or less about what is Jason? How how much is he Superman? How much is he Kryptonian? How much is he human? Like this needs to be the 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 Superboy story, not not the story where we give you a glimpse that let you know that he's Superman, but we don't deal with that. Like this needs to be uh, that needs to be the story, not Lex Luthor marries an old lady to get her mansion to steal some crystals from the Fortress of Solitude. Like no mention of how he figured out where the Fortress of Solitude was. This bizarre, weird plan to build an island off the coast of Florida. I mean, this movie needs to be about Jason if they're going to make this an interesting movie. And here's the yeah. thing: that's an all, and that, and and here's a, that's an awful place to be. It really is because you know all I can think of, you know. So you you said the Kevin Spacey thing. All I can think of is when I see this kid, is that that whole scene from uh, Mallrats where they're talking about how that's going to be pretty much an impossibility. <laughs> Lois carrying oh, wow. his uh, seed, and I'm not going to go through all the things because it gets a little bit graphic for this program. But uh, you know, basically, he said like if she could even in in uh, survive the uh, the impregnating process. If, well, that's why Superman Two has to still be canon because he gave up his powers to be with Lois for a little bit, and that's when it had to happen. Yeah, but right. th- th- so and then he erased her memory with a kiss, so that's why she doesn't know who the dad of the kid is. But would then he get only a quarter power then or something? Or does he, I mean, <laughs> hey, how does that work? This is the, the this is the best nerd argument we've had in a long time. So I want to savor the moment. <laughs> <laughs> and also, why, why'd she choose the name Jason? Yeah, man, that's not good either. They, I, they really need to stick with Jonathan Kent, man. It, that would have been nice. Yeah. But, and do you, do you name the kid? Do you name that kid a Kryptonian name as well? Is his name like Jason L? Yeah, man, exactly. His name his name needs to be J L, but his Earth name is like Jonathan Kent, something weird like that. But they they got to give him some name that's an homage of some sort to the comics. I mean, Jason just sounds like I don't know, maybe a guy that Brian Singer uh, liked from high school or something was named Jason. It's just a boring name. <laughs> Jason, it is, you, it, he's cool. It is very, it is very boring. There's and there's no like there's no explanation to why Jason. <laughs> exactly, know? or at least let him have a cool middle name like Jason Voorhees White. Now that would have redeemed it a little bit. Every every Turns Jason that listens a- to this show is now just like dear hero movie podcast. My name is Jason, <laughs> and I'm a very very charismatic person. And how dare you? Oh, sorry, Jason. I wasn't talking about you. I was talking about all the other ones. Okay, good. <laughs> but but no, man, this movie needs to be 
Lex Luthor finds out Superman's back, kidnaps Lois Lane to draw Superman out. And then, I mean, it's, it's, you just got to be boilerplate, man. If, if what Brian Singer wants to do is give us a story that's in the same universe as the Donner Superman movie, you just stick with the boilerplate story where Superman kidnaps Lois Lane to bring Superman out to rescue her. Somewhere in that whole ordeal is when the reveal is that that's Superman's kid. Then at the end of the de- by the end of the movie, that kid needs to have powers that's almost like like Incredible Hulk, like he can't quite control him and it scares him. So Superman is going to to mentor him into the world of dealing with those powers on Earth. I thought you were going to say you know, send him into right. the Phantom Zone. <laughs> I love and, you know, and because and, and and the, how- the other part to this. Is that the you know you've stuck because they, they it's the same plot, it's the exact same plot. It's a land grab. It's it's weapons. Yep. It's it's the same exact thing, only done worse. And give us an Otis. I mean, come on, give us an Otis. If you're going to be an homage, give us the good stuff, not just the boring stuff. You know. Oh, we've got an uh, Otis and Kyle Penn, who I don't even know if he has a single line of dialogue in this movie, and it, he seems so weird and out of place. And he especially was in 2006, where it's just like, isn't that the guy from Harold and Kumar? On what's he yeah. doing? He's not doing anything funny. I know that guy for doing funny stuff. None of this is funny. And you know what would have been great is if they just called him Otis. We were supposed to understand it's the exact same character. No explanation. Just go with it. I would have loved that. He just turned into an yeah. Indian guy in his twenties. I don't. Know. We don't know. Hey. And you just have that same line where he's looking at the map and it says Otisburg. Yeah, exactly. Otisburg. Exactly. <laughs> you know, you, you need Miss Tessmacher. You need Otis if you're going to do the homage. If you're going to do a new story, then do a new story. Don't give, don't give me this weird thing where, like, yeah, nostalgia gets some credit, but there's a difference in an Easter egg and and a badly made sequel. You know what I mean? Like he couldn't yeah. decide. He he was trying to make a sequel. But it came out more like a ba- like an Easter egg that was just overdone. Uh, it, it just fell apart in tone. He would have been better off, like, you know, uh, when the first Punisher movie didn't do so great. Uh, when I say the first one, I mean when the uh, Punisher movie with uh, Thomas Jane didn't do so great. Yeah. And then they made the Ray Stevenson one. And right. they said, is, is this a sequel or a reboot? And they said, yes. <laughs> like that's what he should have done when people ask is this a sequel or is this a reboot and he could be like you know what you watch it whatever makes you happiest just feel that and way that's what it. it feels like it feels like it is stuck between that like like he doesn't even know like he wants to be and i understand it because it's a revered film and everyone wants to be very uh you know cordial to that movie and stuff but you have to also put aside the fact that you're not going to make that movie you just aren't you're, you need to make and, something you know, else the john williams score hold that back for the third act when something triumphant happens. And then we're like, Oh my goodness. I didn't think we were going to get that song. And now I'm so into Mm -hmm. it. Especially like if you had a scene where Superman and Jason were fighting side by side using superpower. And that's when you break out the song. That's great. But to have the opening credits in the Salkin style with that song blaring and just setting me. Yeah. Everything man setting me up for disappointment. And the worst part of it all in that opening sequence is when I see John Peter's name in that font. And I know what I'm in for. Oh, let me tell you, I watched a lot of special features on this, probably at least probably close to two hours. Uh, and John Peters is in there and John Peters, I will say this for a man who had a history of doing hair, his hair is awful. Just awful. It's like it's like a 1980s hockey style haircut, and it's just a really bad dye job. You think for a guy who did hair that he'd have a better hairstylist? Shame on you, John Peters. Well, I mean, it's the cobbler's kid has no shoes. I mean, exactly. it's the same deal. You know? Exactly. But if you look back at the old ones, his hair looked pretty good. Now it's just like oh, what the I don't, I don't know. But he did send everyone the same email that then they all printed out and read like simultaneously, congratulating them on X, Y, and Z or something. So all you I know what the worst thing money. I want to blame uh, the worst thing I want to blame this movie for, and uh, I think it kind of goes back to uh, something that you had said about the Crow comic book, Sean was one of the things you miss you misliked about the Crow comic book the most was that it set you against ever reading Sandman for a long time. Didn't you say something to that effect? I did. It took forever. And I think that this movie really turned me off when uh, the Nolan Batman movies came out. I had no excitement for those whatsoever because I was expecting more of this. Yeah, I, I could see how this would easily 
it, it, you've been burned so many times. There's only so many things that you can kind of go into with any sort of, you know, expectations. You don't go into another because, Tyler Perry movie going. I and, bet this and, one's going to be way better. Batman Begins came out. Yeah, I mean, what Batman Begins is about about the same time as this movie, isn't it? It comes out after. Yeah, that's it's, definitely after. It's it's oh seven is Batman Begins. I want to say. Uh, let me figure this out because I want to tell because this was a time when I wasn't seeing a lot of movies in the movie theater. Like there was a window there where making it to the theater didn't work so well for me. Sure. So I was making a lot of my decisions on the old uh, Blu-ray DVD uh, uh, aisle. So regardless of which one came out first, when it was time to check things out, I guess, uh, yeah, I think Batman Begins actually came out in theaters year before. Bo- year before. It did. It's 2005. Huh. Yeah. So that makes this movie that much worse, man, to realize that somebody had already kind of figured it out what to do wow. and they still gave us this. Yeah. But but I watched this on Blu-ray first and it made me just not interested in Batman Begins. I think I carried ill will from this into the Nolan movie. Like it was it was definitely not until Dark Knight came out that I was able to go back and enjoy Batman Begins because I knew that this was going somewhere, you know? Mm-hmm. mm-hmm. But wow, that's just mind blowing to know that this was essentially DC's follow up film to to Batman Begins. Yeah, that is surprising. I, I for some reason, it fe- and it even feels like this movie came out before, just by the you know the way it is, the way it's all put together. Yeah, that that is crazy, man, crazy. Wow. And Brian's, I mean Brian Singer, you go back and you watch the X Men films, and they're good because there was a vacuum. You yes. know, there there weren't good comic book movies. There were no X-Men movies. And he did something that was uh, cool. You know, nobody's yeah. ever going to go back and say that they hold up to the current uh, Marvel movies or that they hold up to the Dark Knight or, or any of the high bar stuff. But people are still going to go back and say, you know what? Those are pretty darn good movies. But when he comes to make Superman Returns, he he did not bring that same kind of energy or creativity. I don't understand what, but I honestly think he was, well, there's two things. Number one, I think he's just too much in love with the concept of what he was trying to do. I think he was trying too hard to do something that can't be done. And then number two, you know, I, I don't think it's any secret that Superman's just the most difficult character to tell stories with. That's, that's definitely true. Well, this is also really kind of the height of Brian Singer power he had been on both X Men movies, obviously, and he'd uh, been producing House, which was a gigantic success, and uh, when it when it first started out and everything. So, I think they were very like Warner Brothers was like, this guy can do you know no wrong. Let's go ahead and just give him whatever he wants. Let him do whatever he feels like. He seems to be doing you know something right here. Let's just let him have it. Huh. That's a guess. I don't know. And then I don't know that he did much successful after this until uh, the X Men kind of got their turnaround with uh, 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 Days of Future Past or something like that. Wasn't that when? Because he, he didn't even do, you know, Matthew Vaughn did the first class movie, yeah. right? So and, you know, who knows? And it seems like everything that he he that that Matthew Vaughn did for X Men First Class, Brian Singer hated. Yeah, it, it was weird. Like he. It, I, like first, Brian Singer was kind of shoved out of the X Men universe. Then with X Three, that was just a stinker. He acted like he was too cool for the X Men universe. Then Matthew Vaughn came back and made it cool again, and then he yanked it out from under Vaughn almost. You know what I mean? Like once it was cool again, he jumped right back into it. You remember me? You used to love me. Let me get back in here and like, oh well, we've actually outgrown you. Yeah, uh, but once again, I I know surprisingly little about the uh, body of work from Brian Singer other than the X-Men movies and this. Well, Unusual Suspects, I'm sure you've seen that. Oh, yeah, man, that that's probably what... That's a movie... Uh, that's a movie that is going to get you a lot of opportunities. You know what I mean? I'm trying to think of the right way to put it. Like, like yeah. you're going to be allowed to screw up a couple of times after yeah. something like the usual suspect. <laughs> I like, totally like, forgot yeah. that that was him. Apt That's the Kevin Spacey like real, connection, yeah. too. Yeah, Apt Pupil was, was like, it was small, but like well-respected, and then yeah. usual suspects, and then he j- you know jumped into your X-Men uh, world there. So, like, he he's had like a, a little trajectory there. Uh, but honestly, after this was really kind of the start of, I don't want to say downfall per se, but it, he certainly has not gotten back to anywhere close to the strata that he was previously, in my opinion. And, and you know, I, I don't know that it's a fair 
comparison to make or not. So I apologize if you guys don't think it is, but the usual suspects was kind of like a sixth sense type movie. Like the whole movie kind of hinged on one little sort of twist thing. And then, uh, I don't think he followed it up with anything that quite caught that, you know what I mean? And went to the superhero world. Shyamalan went to the superhero world in his own way. So I kind of see some parallels there. You get, you get to, uh, you get to strike out a few at bats before you get benched after something like the usual suspects or the sixth sense. Yeah, I mean, Lord knows Shyamalan, Shyamalan probably got more, quote unquote, more chances uh, than just about anybody else out there. Even though some of his stuff, even the things that people kind of, you know, poo poo, aren't nearly as bad as some of the, you know, Brian Singer misses, in my opinion. And um, I don't know, Brian Singer also seemed to kind of come out from a public relations standpoint pretty clean from those lawsuits compared to other people sadly which I don't and, quite understand and, and, and it's worse and it's worse than that because uh he basically i don't know if he quit or walked off or got fired from half of that bohemian rhapsody movie that's coming out not too awful long but he's still getting full credit for directing the whole thing so uh things are not good for him yeah it's just just i i don't yeah there's just things i don't get man like i don't know what happened or what didn't happen with any of these accusations but it's just strange that he came out so smooth compared to other people who really did not come out as smoothly as he did. I don't get it. Who knows? Uh, but you know what? You know what I really don't get is how. Good lord! <laughs> you all right there, buddy? Sorry, my knee popped. <laughs> <laughs> what I want to understand is uh, how this movie relates back to our good friend Sylvester Stallone. Well, thank you, Adam. I have a prepared statement. Oh. When Kate Bosworth was 14 years old, she wasn't an actress just yet. She didn't come from an acting family, but she did come from a wealthy family, and she was a champion equestrian. She learned of a casting call for a movie about horses. That open audition was for the 1998 Robert Redford hit film, The Horse Whisperer, and she won the role of the female lead's best friend. Her previous acting experience had consisted of singing at country fairs, and acting in a community theater production of Annie in which she didn't even play the role of Annie. In her bio, the pretty little rich girl who could ride horses claims that she took the next 18 months off to live a normal life before opting to plunge into acting again. And in 2000, she landed the role of the football co-captain's girlfriend in the Denzel Washington movie Remember the Titans. Ever since then, she's been riding a rocket ship fueled with nothing but her talent. She would go on to star in the movie's Blue Crush, Rules of Attraction, in the movie that, in my opinion, has one of the best titles ever, Win a Date with Tad Hamilton. But the zenith of her career appears to be her role as Lois Lane in Superman Returns, because after this movie, she stars in projects that would make most people say, oh yeah, that was a movie. (laughs) <laughs> She's not a bad actress, but she hasn't had that role that makes her either America's sweetheart or America's grand dame of cinema. But I'd imagine that it's pretty difficult to access to, to access your personal demons when you've been pretty and rich your entire life. I don't know how Adam does it. <laughs> Indeed. <laughs> Then in 2013, she starred in Homefront, which also co-stars Jason Statham, James Franco, and Winona Ryder. That's a lot of famous people. And the screenplay was written by none other than Chuck Logan. Actually, the book was written based on the book by Chuck. The, 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 the book, the movie was based on, was written by Chuck Logan. The screenplay was written by none other than the $400 million man himself, Sylvester Stallone. We've spoken about Homefront before on this podcast, so I'm not going to do go into a deep dive here, but it has 6.5 stars on IMDb user rating, so it must be great. Just to give you a guideline, the Mary-Kate and Ashley Olsen movie, New York Minute, has 4.9 stars. <laughs> Good movie, too. Kate Bosworth is still acting, working on movies with names like The Domestics and Before I Wake and Nona. And it's probably a matter of time before she ends up playing Batman's mom or the Flash's <laughs> grandma. And there you have it, Agent Pierce. This week's Stallone connection is Kate Bosworth. Now, Richard and Jason White, let's review Superman Returns, or as I like to call it, Jesus with a cape. <laughs> <laughs> 
Indeed. Bruce, where does Superman Returns fall on the Robin rating system for you, sir? I've heard time and time again, uh, not so much in the last year, but there was maybe two, three years ago a push where people were saying that this movie, Superman Returns, is a film that deserves revisiting. Uh, there was like a push for folks to convince me that it's better than it got credit for the first time around. And I will concede that there's some interesting uh, questions that are being raised here, however, um, they're just dropped. You know, in the attempt to make a loving homage to a Donner film, it, it it didn't work. Doesn't change anything. The fact is, it bored me just as much now as it did 2006 or whenever I watched it on my uh, PS3 Blu-ray player. A uh, common expression is that the best revenge is a life well lived, and I would offer up to Brian Singer that the best homage is a story well told. And sadly, I don't feel like this was one. So I'm going to have to give it to Stephanie Brown. Stephanie Brown. All righty. Sean, what do you got? Oh, that's exactly what I was going to give it to Stephanie Brown. You know, I the, the thing that's a big bummer about this movie is that I remembered it a lot more fondly than it actually is. Um, you know, because I can remember at the time thinking like, man, that's really great. I love when he goes out in space at the end and he smiles. That's awesome. Uh, but this movie, you know, it's a lot of like, wish unfulfilled and, and, and like hopelessness and it's super not fun. Uh, so it's a Stephanie Brown for me. Yeah. I I'm going just ever so slightly above a Stephanie Brown and just giving it the bare minimal Damian Wayne, uh, because I do like Ralph. I like what he's, what he's, you know, at least attempting to do with what he's given. I don't blame a lot of this on him. I don't blame most of the stuff on the actors themselves. I think that, you know, they're, they've kind of, uh, got what they've got and there's all that, that's all they can really do with it. Uh, and, and it tells in future on when you see him in, you know, stuff like, uh, legends of tomorrow or whatever, anything in the little Arrowverse there, uh, he's really good. He's a very charismatic guy. And, you know, you, you just, you can't help but watch him. And it, it, it pains me because it feels like you could have had something else that's different here. And of course, but still at the same time, he is a very scrawny Superman and boy, oh boy, when we, we've got, you know, Henry Cavill there as Superman. That's, that's tough to beat boy. That, that dude looks like Superman. So, uh, but he oh, really does. He just, he looks like, <laughs> like they just put a comic and like, Oh look, it just came to life. How about that? And Ralph, when you look at him, it's just like, boy, Superman doesn't look like he could hurt much of anybody. He's in shape, but is he Superman? I don't know. Uh, so <laughs> that's it for me. Uh, so that's it, everybody. Next week, uh, we're doing another thing. Have you heard about this? It's called our Patreon vote. And you, how do you vote, you ask? Well, that's simple. You head on over to patreon.com slash HMP and, uh, you know, Support the show in any way, shape, or form. Even if it's at the uh, dollar level, you get to vote on what we watch. And uh, here are your choices uh, for this vote and go round. Uh, we're going to review uh, either Batman 1943 serial, some more serial action, uh, a uh, perennial favorite here that always gets a couple of votes but never has quite uh, gotten the uh, checker flag, Barb Wire. There's another one that's called uh, Spider-Man The Dragon's Challenge. That's a live-action Spider-Man thing that it looks like it takes place in Hong Kong. It looks awful. Uh, Man, I can't wait. I hope that one gets it. I, I can't wait to see that. <laughs> uh, plus Man-Thing. That's another one that's just like has kind of been haunting us in the back of our minds here at HMP. So we're going to put it out to our patrons. Which one of these movies would you like us to see? And you vote by going over to patreon.com slash HMP, supporting the show at any level. And uh, hey, I'm going to Dragon Con, so I need an extra nickel or two. So head on over to patreon.com slash HMP. In the meantime, uh, Bruce, where can we find more of your work on the internet sir i'm just telling people to be on the lookout for the vigilant published by 2000 ad my traditional publishing review uh not premiere is that the right word yeah. i don't know debut it's my debut my traditional publishing debut six page comic story called yow the demon touched home is included in the vigilant uh you can order it uh, if you can't you know you can always get your local comic shop to order it for you may not be available till September 15th if you're in North America, but go ahead and place that order now so they can get that in for you. If you're in uh, the United Kingdom or, or in Europe, you can go ahead and pick that up at your local news agent or comic shop. And if you don't want to uh, go out to the old local comic book store and risk catching mono by making out with a stranger, you can buy it digitally from the treasuryofbritishcomics.com. 
Just go to treasuryofbritishcomics.com for two ninety nine. You can get the digital version. So it's there for people that want to read it. Please uh, give it a gander and tell me what you think. I know some people have picked it up because a few folks have tweeted their uh, uh, thing, just like Adam asked, haven't they? They have indeed. It's been pretty cool to see that. And Bruce, I, I didn't want to tell you this, but I, I kind of looked at a review here real quick, and it said uh, this bit's written by Bruce Leslie, who we imagine is rather handsome. I don't. We shouldn't have told you that because it will <laughs> hey, fuel I'm your just ego. Happy but... to know that uh, Comic Vine credited some guy named Bruce Jones with having written my story. <laughs> He's going through time. Just wanted to kill some dude named Bruce Jones. <laughs> uh, Sean, if we could find any of your work, where might we go? Uh, if you go to Patreon and support the show, you get our other show called Dinger Zone. And uh, this week was a lively discussion, so check that out. Uh, you can also find me on Twitter, at Hero Movie Show. And uh, you can find me on the internet at uh, dogeatpod.com. Which, by the way, there's a there's a movie coming out. I just saw a trailer for it today. It's it almost is a bridge between two worlds. I don't know if we're going to cover it on this show, but it is called Dog Superheroes. Uh, and uh, I, I figure maybe we'll try to get Noah on and we can all review the same thing. It doesn't have any real comic <laughs> connection, and they're mostly just like rescue dogs. But it still feels oh, like... Want, because they're called capes and flying. Because they're called superhero dogs, it feels like somehow there well, needs to be a... Well, there is, a, there is one, of the, one of the movies in the, uh, uh, in the Air Bud franchise called Super Buddies. Yeah, it's a classic. So, you know, we, maybe we'll get to one of those at some point. But uh, we'll do that at another date. Until then, everybody, for Bruce, Leslie, Sean Keenan, I'm Adam Portress. Remember, you got to be... Wait a minute, that's the other show. That, that's because I wanted to <laughs> plug Preacher. I forgot. It was in my mind. I didn't do my plugs. Preacher podcast, everybody. We only got two episodes left of it. We're going to be doing a live show at Dragon Con. We can't wait to see you there. Live HMP at Dragon Con. Live Film Find at Dragon Con. We got a lot of stuff coming up at Dragon Con. So that's why I'm going to say Dragon Con, Dragon Con, Dragon Con until you get it through your thick skulls that Atlanta and Labor Day weekend is where you need to be. So, with that said, for Bruce yes, Leslie, Sean Keaton. Yes, uh, indeed. Possibly be Adam Portress. My name is Adam Portress. The listeners. Stay super, everybody. <laughs> Goodbye, Marty.